Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. We can see a lot of you already joined us on time, uh, but we're expecting a few more participants. So let's give them a couple of minutes uh, to join us. Um, Mr. Hicker, uh, welcome. How are you today? Doing great. Uh, thank you for so much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I want to welcome everyone who's already joining us. And uh, before we get started, I actually want to find out uh, what part of the world are you coming from? If you can use the question box or the chat window, if it's available to you, let me know where you are located and just give me the, the country. Where, where are you coming from? I'm actually right now located in Maryland in the in, in US, which is part of the greater DC metro area. So I'm actually about uh, seven hours away from you guys it, it, that are coming in from Saudi or uh, uh, the, the uh, UAE. So let me know where you're coming from and just type in the, uh, either question or, uh, questions or in the chat if it's available, where are you uh, located at? Um, something really good to mention because we have as well a lot of uh, newcomers. Uh, mm -hmm. So wondering who is Leoron, who we are and what we do. Um, uh, just to mention, Leoron Professional Development Institute is the EMEA's leading business events and corporate training company. Uh, Leoron's mission is to help corporate clients and government entities worldwide in strengthening the skills, competencies, and abilities of their people by providing them with uh, top quality continuous training programs conducted by unrivaled global experts and implemented by the best event managers in the industry. So basically, that bring, brings us here, uh, Mr. Hector and I. Uh, I think we're uh, going good. Uh, should should give, we give them like a few more seconds, like 10 more seconds, just to so everybody can say? Sure, sure. We can maybe, maybe you know, in a minute or so, we can get started and um, uh, you, you can actually just uh, formally launch the, uh, the program. I see a lot of comments like we have from uh, all the way the world. So we have like from Kenya, Dubai, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi. We have a lot from Europe, from US. Perfect. All right. It's quite an interesting, let's say, mixture of, uh, of people. That's perfect. That's okay. perfect. Okay, Mr. Director. I, I think I can see the majority of participants joined us uh, in the meantime. I think so we can officially start the webinar. What do you say? Uh, yes, that, that's perfect. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I'm here today to participate in the opening ceremony of this webinar. On behalf of Leon Professional Development Institute and our expert trainer, Mr. Hector Del Castillo, uh, let me warmly welcome you all here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Victor and I'm the event manager for this webinar. Uh, I'll be here to help you in anything you need and to make sure that everything is running smoothly. Before we start, I would like to introduce our expert trainer, Mr. Hector. I'm pleased to announce that uh, Hector is one of our lead trainers from our marketing training events. Uh, he has over 18 years of experience strengthening companies to outperform competitors. Uh, he's passionate about working with business and product leaders to design, launch, and support enterprise products that customers will love. Uh, I would kindly ask you all not to hesitate to write down your questions in the question sector on the control panel. So after the presentation, we're going to have time for answering your questions and maybe discussing your ideas. After successfully completing the webinar, all of you, you will receive an official certificate of attendance. One email will automatically be sent on your email addresses that you left in your registration details. Well, we'll look forward into another successful webinar. And uh, thank you all, and I wish you have a good and highly productive session. I can feel your eagerness for learning, so keep that positive atmosphere. <laughs> uh, Hector, the microphone is yours. I'm turning off my camera and mic, so take over and enjoy. See you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, and thanks, everyone. Welcome. And my name is Hector Del Castillo, Chief Product Officer at Bold PM, and also Expert Trainer at Leoron Institute. And it is my pleasure to be here today and discuss this particular topic, how to lead your product through the COVID-19 recovery. And today's discussion will, will entail um, multiple things that is about how is it that you as a product manager or product marketing manager or any other role that you're doing within product, that how is it that you can actually lead your teams and your product to persevere during this COVID-19 economic crisis and be able to then accelerate and scale back to growth once recovery begins. So before we get started, I wanna tell you that we're actually recording this whole thing 
and the audience is on listen only mode so that you can actually uh, hear me well. And also, if you have any questions, there will be a Q&A and type in your questions using the question box and there'll be a moderated Q&A at the end of my discussion today and we'll get into the, that information so that we can actually ensure that we answer all of your questions. If you encounter any audio issues, uh, be sure to refresh your browser. If you're hearing breakup, it may be your internet connection. Uh, we already did sound checks on our side and um, we make sure that at least if you have any, any audio issues, let the moderator know and perhaps all you need to do is just refresh your browser or log back in and hopefully that'll address your issues. Also, if you, we are recording today's session and you'll be seeing a, uh, actually a video and I'm gonna be sharing on a post event page, my entire presentation. And all you need to do is sign up and signing up, I'll, I'll tell you what link you can actually go. So you can actually sign up. You're gonna get an automated re response via email about today's discussion. And then post event, you'll get a link where you can view the video and the slides of today's discussion. And we're gonna basically go through a very quickly a lot of different things today. So be sure to stay engaged. Also, I wanna give a special thanks to Lioran because they're actually hosting this webcast and they've been doing a great job of hosting the webcast with different expert trainers. And this is actually my first one with Lioran. But I, I do this on, a, on an ongoing basis. And actually, I, I can also invite you to other things that I'm doing where I'm actually use, uh, working with different uh, platforms to actually host some of these webinars that I'm doing. And I have a few of them coming in the next few weeks that are free to attend. So be happy to share that information with you. If you connect with me on LinkedIn or if you sign up on, for, uh, on my landing page, I can prov provide you further updates about other topics that I'm doing in the next few weeks. Also, a special thanks to Podcast Village because they actually convert everything that I record and they take video and create great podcasts out of my content. And I will share all of this content with anyone that actually attends, registers for my events. And that way you can actually review the information in different ways, whether you wanna view the, the video, uh, view the slides or listen to the podcast, you have avail available all three of them from one session if you if you sign up for the session. So shout out to Podcast Village because they do great podcasting services and they produce great listenable content from anything, anything that I do. Also, if you're on Twitter, use this particular hashtags, product management, hashtag product management and hashtag COVID-19 recovery. This is what we're gonna be talking about is how is it that you're going to persevere through the recovery and anything that you share, you're welcome to share any images or any wisdom that comes out of today's discussion and use the hashtag also product strategy. And you can use Lioran's handle, which is at Lioran Group or mine, which is at HM Del Castillo. These are the two. And if you do that, we can retweet and reshare any content that you send via Twitter. Feel free to share anything that comes out, even if it's uh, pictures or you know a few of the snippets that we're gonna be discussing in today's session. So if you wanna watch the replay, here is the link where you can actually sign up. And just so that you guys are aware, I am going to type in this short URL so that you can actually click through and sign up. And that I just send that via chat. You should be able to see it. If you don't see it, make sure you take a screenshot of this because this, is, this page is already live. There's a web form that you can submit. All you have to do is click through the sign up button submit the information and many of you already did this as, as part of re registration but those of you who have not signed up you can sign up using this particular link and then you'll be getting a link where you'll see a post event page where you'll see all of these things that i talked about posted so you can either view the, the video look at the slides or actually listen to the podcast all of those three things will be available post the live session after today's session. Today's discussion is gonna be about how can you lead your teams and your product to persevere through COVID-19 recovery? And we're gonna be talking about multiple things in here. We're gonna be sharing information that is about talking about the current situation. We're gonna talk about why most products fail 
and that's reality because there's a high failure rate and this was this has been around for years we'll talk about why most products fail why product management has risen in importance and we're going to talk about how to build resilience to your product to ensure that your product and your teams persevere through current COVID-19 crisis and begins to scale and grow as recovery begins. We're also gonna talk about the value of why you should consider getting certified for those of you who are not certified as product managers or product marketing managers. But we're also gonna talk about why it matters to, for you that if you have one certification, you should actually pursue additional certifications and all of these certifications are available through Lioran. And we're gonna also talk about key takeaways as well. And finally, we're gonna have Q&A and this whole program is gonna be fast-tracked because I'm maybe going faster than you are comfortable. I have a lot of content to discuss, but hopefully you'll be able to review this and maybe uh, give you a chance to ask any questions. So if I'm going too fast, it's okay because just type in your question. I'm gonna leave a, a, a good 20, maybe 25 minutes so that you can actually uh, we can actually get to the Q&A and then answer any questions that you might have. So let's go ahead and get started. So as we start thinking about what is the current impact, I want you guys, to, I'm gonna push this poll to, for you and I want you to respond to this question. And let me launch the poll. And if you can tell me, here's the available answers. How have you been personally impacted in whatever role you're doing today because of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can choose from you're currently unemployed now, you're underemployed because you're a contractor and now you're working less hours or you you're now have to look for a new contract. There's no impact. You're doing the same old, same old as before now, or you're now 100% teleworking where before you were mostly having to commute somewhere. And the last one is you're completely overwhelmed with work. So I'll let you answer this question and just kind of look at these choices. Pick the best one that applies to you and let me know. I'll give you a few seconds before I actually will close the poll. It looks like uh, many of you are already responding. So I'm going to actually keep this alive and I can tell you and share my experience, right? I actually, I, I do a lot of contracting. As to, actually, as an expert trainer uh, with Lioran, I'm a contractor, right? And the majority of my work up until the first quarter of this year for the last five years has been involving international traveling as I am doing live in-person training with organizations like Lioran. Well, as soon as March 11th came in, and that's when this COVID-19 was officially declared by the World Health Organization a pandemic, which means it's a disease that's spreading across markets, across regions, and now there's going to be some significant collateral human damage uh, in the way that this disease works. And it's not the first pandemic, right? We've had multiple pandemics, but how many of you have actually seen this type of reaction in your lifetimes? It almost, it's almost as like nobody even could have foreseen what happened. And we're gonna share this because my impact is that I'm currently unemployed or underemployed because even though I'm not a blue collar worker, meaning I'm not doing manual work, I'm doing instructor in front of executives and managers, I've had to reinvent my business model, my entire business model, because moving forward, I'm planning that for the rest, at least for a period of 12 to 18 months, I will not be able to do any international traveling. And I now have to reinvent my entire business model in order to do this because I'm in the first category or the second category at best. So here's why well, I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to show the results and I'm going to share results. You can see that the majority of you are overwhelmed with work. Well, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It could go either way. It's a double edged sword, right? Actually, the majority of you are now teleworking. That's 55%. That's the number one group teleworking. So the majority of you are now teleworking. The second highest group at 22% are overwhelmed with work. And I'd like to know who you are. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. And then 15%, no impact, so it's a minority. And then a few of you 
a total of 5% for unemployed, 4% are underemployed. And I mentioned that me as an expert trainer that does international traveling in order to do live in person, I'm actually in that category of either unemployed or underemployed. And it's kind of expected for me because I'm a contractor, right? And usually that's what happens is you're a contractor, you're the first ones to suffer whenever there's any downturn in the economic situation within your market. So I'm gonna hide this and I'm actually gonna be launching a second poll. And the second poll is about this. How has the current pandemic and the current crisis impacted demand for your product? And let me launch this poll and then we can talk about it in a few minutes. So the available choices are, you've seen significant drop in demand for your product, meaning revenue, and now you have to figure out what to do next. Or you've seen some significant reduced demand because this is like double digit drop in revenue and it's almost like happens overnight, or you're seeing the same demand for your product, or you're seeing double digit increase on your product, or you're seeing just overwhelming demand. And overwhelming means that there's so many orders that now you have a back or, uh, you actually are back ordered because now there's a queue of customers wanting to get your product and you can't get, get it out or install it or set it up fast enough as the customers are now coming to you asking for your product. Which one of these, choose one of these five and pick the best one. And I'm gonna share with you my experience. So I mentioned my product is actually delivering live in-person training that requires international traveler traveling and I'm in front of managers and executives within companies. And the fact that I cannot travel, I can still deliver but because I cannot travel and most people want, and that mindset is they want to see in-person training because they, their mindset is in-person training is better than virtual training. I've seen significant drop in demand because all the different things that I had, they went out the door. And this year in 2020, I had over a hundred training days scheduled. And out of those hundred training day minimum of schedule training, only five actually happened in the first quarter of 2020. So what that means is that 95, the majority of my work went away because most customers want live in-person training. And guess what? The answer is most experts are saying you won't be able to attend any live in-person training like you used to back in 2019, at least for the next 12 to 18 months. That's reality. So now there's gonna be a change in the buying the behavior of my customers, and I'm waiting for them to actually make decisions in order to see the value of doing interactive, live, virtual training, and not just training, because training is mostly lecturing. I actually do a lot of workshops, which means engaging with them, interacting with them virtually, using tools like GoToTraining, and there are we're going to talk about some of these tools that are highly collaborative that I'm already using to actually deliver live, engaging, hands-on training and workshops for the same stakeholders. And, and that's the reality. So I'm going to close the poll now, and I'm going to show you the results. And here are the results. The largest group, 40%, 40% of you, the audience, are seeing significant reduced demand. That means significant drop in sales, double digit drop from one quarter to another, from today's quarter to last year's quarter, you're seeing double digit drop in demand, which means your revenue is going down almost overnight. 31% of you said you've seen significant drop, which means you're probably losing more than 50% of your annual or monthly revenue, quarterly revenue, compared to last year, same time. That's the second group at 31%. 13% are seeing the same demand. Lucky you guys, I'd like to know who you are and what industries you're in. And 10%, only 10% of you are seeing more demand for your product. So theoretically, if only 23% are seeing either same demand or more demand, and very few of you are seeing overwhelming demand, 
what is happening to the 71%? That's the majority of you in this audience. 71% of the audience are seeing reduced demand or significant drop in demand. What do you do? Because that is the challenge and that is what we're going to be tackling in today's session is how do you survive the economic impact of COVID-19 in order for your product to remain in the market and be able to then scale as soon as recovery begins. So we're going to talk about, first of all, current situation. And as a product manager, that's the first thing you do, right? As I'm coming into a new, a new client, a new environment, a new company when I'm being engaged, I usually will do this. My first 90 days in any new contract is to assess a company. And assess, assessment means more than just a company. Assessing means there are five components to the way you assess, and it starts with assess the business climate, which is what we're going to talk about here. What is your the current climate? And I'm going to talk about specifically information that I've found because COVID-19 crisis has generated so much data that is just overwhelming. There's so much information available because it's one of the best documented pandemics ever in the human history. And the issue is that there's way too much information. And the second issue is that there's also a lot of misinformation. And that's a struggle because trying to really get the current situation is a lot of work because the, the amount of data is overwhelming and you have to be able to discern good information, facts and figures from misinformation. And you want to eliminate any misinformation in your data sources. That is the struggle of anyone that is doing big data analytics, for example. So today's environment, I'm going to talk about what McKenzie is saying, because they're saying, what is the impact? And the impact may depend on the depth of disruption within your industry or your market or markets, the length of disruption, how long it takes for you to actually start seeing recovery and then start looking at the shape of recovery. How quickly are you going to be able to ramp up once recovery begins? So those are three elements that we need to start looking at and start predicting so that you can actually figure out how to throttle back, take your foot off the accelerator, maybe put on the brakes as you're seeing curves in the business climate, maybe U-turns or maybe those horseshoe turns, and then be able to accelerate when needed. And you're stopping, you're slowing down, stopping, and accelerating, and that's going to be some time all the way until recovery begins. So typically, all of these things are the things that you want to start gauging. Here's the impact. And the impact is, and this is actually something that, that McKenzie published just recently. This is for U.S. market. There may be available this information by someone like McKenzie or Bain or Boston Consulting Group. It's information that is hard to come by, but McKenzie has made this available for free for the U.S. market. And it shows the impact to industrial sectors within U.S. And you'll see in the highest impact in areas like commercial aerospace, oil and gas, air travel, insurance, banks. And on the other side of the spectrum, the ones that have had least amount of impact, economic impact, meaning these are the ones the ones on the left are the ones that have significant drop in demand, right? No different than what some of you are saying. And then the ones that are seeing some drop in demand, but maybe are also overwhelmed with new orders because a new segment and a new buyer behavior has been triggered by this crisis. And what I want to do is I want to actually be able to ask you, if you can tell me which as of your industries, which of these industries is your current target industry? And what I want you to tell me is, in this case, I'm actually going to be closing this poll because I would really want to do is type, if you can type in on the questions box or your, your chat window, whichever is available, tell me which of these industrial sectors are your target sectors, meaning these are your customers, your targets, your product is targeting or you're selling into any of these industries. 
So how many of you are selling into commercial aerospace, oil and gas, or any energy company? How many of you are selling into insurance companies, not just life and business and other type of insurance, but also health plan providers, health insurers? How many of you are selling into banks? How many of you are selling into any investment firms that are all part of financial services? If, that's, if those are your targets because they're seeing significant drop in demand, I would say you're suffering because they're ordering less than they were a year ago. And right now, even if you have a long-term contract they're trying that, uh, that says that they need to buy at a certain volume, they're trying to renegotiate that because they don't need to buy that much. And it's going to be a long time before they're at the same level of demand that they were even like at the beginning of this year. If you're targeting logistics, consumer, certain retail sectors, the ones that have been less impacted, you may have be you may be in that boat where you're not seeing very much demand or you're seeing overwhelming demand, an increase in demand. What I wanted to find out is tell me, share that information, and then I can tell you what the impact is because this allows you to start seeing. And even though this is U.S. in your market, you need to understand what this is because. Who are you targeting may be deeply impacted, which means now they're going to buy be, be, be buying less from you if you're their supplier, if you're in their supply chain. And in very few cases, because we saw the poll, very few of you are seeing, it's not the majority, it's like 30% in, in this audience that is seeing either same demand or some increase in demand or overwhelming increase in demand. Some of these may be healthcare, right? If you're a hospital or a clinic right now, and you're the one that's in the front line of tending to anyone who has become infected with COVID-19 and now is showing symptoms, they're the ones that are overwhelmed with work. And therefore, anyone else as part of the supply chain is also seeing a lot, a lot of work, right? And that means that in that scenario, it's also the actual people that are uh, that are actually involved that are actually also overwhelmed. All just the entire supply chain is, is actually seeing significant demand. So let's talk about moving on to, to this. If you can share that with you and, and we can actually talk about which of these industries that you're that you, are you targeting. And if your targets are deeply impacted and now they're seeing significant demand and if yours are supplier, you're also seeing less demand and that's gonna be a long term until recovery starts. So this is why you need to understand the current situation because now you need to start seeing if maybe I need to target a different segment, even if it's an industrial segment, because there are segments that are growing and you need to start going after those quickly. Number four, which of these is more likely to happen? Well, you can say, I wish for a quick recovery, but it may turn to be a significant recession, meaning it's gonna take you at least a year, maybe more to recover. Uh, or a depression, which means you're going to tank pretty quickly, but then getting back up to where it used to be is going to take you two to three years. Most people today, most experts are saying that this is going to be really more like an economic recession, but I think it's going to vary market by market, meaning each and every country is going to be impacted at different, different ways, and it can be anything between a significant recession meaning significant unemployment, to possibly a depression, and hopefully it's not a depression of epic proportions, but here's what the snapshot is. And I think the worst case scenario is that if the entire COVID-19 spread, it can turn into a global recession, much like the 2007. And I think that it, it, all indicators right now even though no economist is willing to fess up, is really we're trying to avoid getting into a global recession because a global recession is bad news. So let's look at what McKenzie, because all of these are McKenzie things. So, so if you're a, supply, a supplier to some of these industrial sectors that have seen a significant drop in demand, you're seeing a significant drop in demand, especially if you have, have a good diversification across industrial sectors, and hoping that some of these sectors are actually getting more or keeping the same demand while others are going down 
and you basically want to make sure that some sectors are increasing demand and you're targeting them while others may be dropping, others are rising and others are staying the same. And you may have a combination of all of these three. But if you're not, then you need to start doing that. And I can tell you that it's going to be about figuring out how which of the elements of the mix would you want to rely on to actually quickly figure out how to reposition your product in working with your teams to do so. So the hardest hit sectors may not see restart uh, until 2021. This is what McKinsey is saying about U.S. market. This may not be the same thing as your market because this has to be done for your market. Here's what the impact is, because what you see here in the 1930s, this dip in gross domestic product for U.S. is the Great Depression. This dip here in the 1940s is due to post-World War II economic recovery. And you see here that we haven't had anything and even the last recession in U.S., which was in 2007, we recovered around 2009, 2010. Right now, McKenzie is estimating the current impact of COVID-19 in U.S. based on real GDP estimated for 2020. We're already, this recession in U.S. is going to be deeper than our last recession. and a close second to the recession that was post-World War II. And this is 20th century stuff. 21st century is here. What I wanted to say is that this is the reality, right? That this COVID-19 right now is actually right now estimated that base case scenario is still going to be worse impact than the 2007 recession we had in U.S. And at the worst case, it's going to be almost as high impact across industrial sectors as post-World War II recession and not even close to the Great Depression, we, which we had in the 1930s in U.S. But this is significant because there's no CEO, there's no living CEO today that has been able to figure out how to turn around their company, their product with this type of recession. And that's reality in US today. And I think that we're gonna to have to figure out what is that you can do if in your country, in your market, with your customers, if this is gonna be a challenge for your executives, how can you step up as a product manager for them to understand this current situation and figure out how to actually get your product team to persevere until recovery starts? And it is possible to do, but you have to do product management the right way. There's a lot of high failure rate. If you talk about, and I talk about this in any of my courses that I teach, uh, in front of product managers, in front of product marketing managers, brand managers, any of these related um, fields and professions, these are the courses that I teach. And reality is, is that whether your products are brands or whether your products are multiple things that are branded by one company, there's a high failure rate of either brands when they're consumer products or products that get launched into market and never become profitable. And the failure rate is no matter what experts you're relying to or what market or industries you're looking at, the failure rate is somewhere between 60 to 90%. These are products that work and they work as designed. They just don't meet customer expectations because nobody bothered to actually look at and ask and even test whether customers want it, whether it's priced right, or whether it's the right solution to their problems. And that's the majority of the resources of why products fail. I'm going to launch this poll and hopefully I won't lose. If I lose a screen, let me know right away, okay, please. But I'm going to launch this poll. Why? I want to know if you tell me the reasons why most products would fail. Why is it that 69%? And I'm going to launch this poll now. And here are these, right? Pick the best one that you think is, is, is uh, the one that you think most products need to be pulled out after being launched. They're pulled out within two or three years after introduction because they have no chance of becoming profitable or even getting to the revenue growth that you need to achieve ROI 
on whatever you invested to ideate and design and build and test and launch that product to the market. No chance of recovering. And now you just have to withdraw from the market. So pick the best answer out of, is it because your value proposition is unclear to your target customers? Is it because your products don't really know who you are or what you do as a brand, as, as a company, or even for your product? Or is it because you don't understand buyer behavior? Or is it because your offering lacks consistency? Or is it because your entire company struggles to deliver a consistent customer experience? Which one of these do you believe is the greatest source of why products within your company are failing today? And I'm gonna give you a few seconds to respond. I see many of you are still responding and we're gonna be talking and sharing the results real quick. And then we're gonna talk about the real scenarios to why most products fail. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and then share my answer. And here's what you see. The majority of you, so number one, number two, number three are pretty close to each other. That's the first thing. If there's a margin of error, everything, all of these responses are within the margin of error, right? Largest group at 31% believe that it's because you have an inconsistent customer experience. And 29% is the second group, second highest group, and says your value proposition is unclear. 27% is a third group. You don't understand buyer behavior. And then 8% prospects don't know who you are as a brand, as a company, or for the, your, your product. 6% your offering lacks consistency. So in reality, when you talk about what experts are saying, achieving a steady flow of successful products, it's a daunting challenge. Most companies, when I come in and assess companies, even though they have, they've been expanding their portfolio of products and that's all they do, they just expand, 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 and they may have not just one product, but multiple product lines and extensions of those products. When you really look at where the majority of the revenue is coming from, number one, and where the majority of their profit, no matter how large their product portfolio is, it typically is no more than a handful. Literally, you can have thousands of SKUs available, maybe even tens of thousands of SKUs available, and only one or a handful of products where the majority of revenue is coming from and with the majority of your portfolio's profitability is coming from. So why, why do they do all this work to put out all these losers and they maintain them in market? That's, to me, a sign of a deficient product management function within the organization. Most of these companies, they're in the majority, right? The majority of companies today, even when they have product management in place, experience any of these or any combination of these five things because very representative to this, a combination of these, and not just one, but multiple of these that are causing multiple failure after failure after failure, even as they have product managers doing the actual, involving the product development process. And it's because often they need to do, they need to work smarter, not harder as an organization. We're gonna talk about what that means. So most vendors don't focus on understanding buyer behavior. That's my personal experience. And typically they don't even know how do we as, to, if you're, if I'm your target customer, how do I go about evaluating products? How do I select the right product for me? And what is what is my purchase decision? And it starts with that because understanding buyer behavior today is the number one thing that you need to understand first before you start even working on a proposed product. Let me repeat this because this is exactly right. If you don't understand buyer behavior and gather the facts and figures, not just your team's perception of what people want, but you go out and start interviewing. That means you go outside your building and interview targets, prospects, not yet your customers, but you understand and empathize with them. This is where you need to start. And by lack of doing this, I can tell you, you're gonna make a lot of errors and omissions in whatever you ideate, in whatever you choose to be the market problem to solve, or even the best proposed solution to solve that market problem that your team has identified. 
and everything goes downhill from there. Doesn't matter how good you are and how much knowledge you have of what you know, uh, technologies that you understand and how expert you are, you're starting with either working on the wrong problem to solve or the wrong proposed solution that has a high market fit. And you're going in the, in the wrong direction to begin with. So often, and this is what BCG is saying, because there is a TED Talk, and I think this TED Talk has been around already available on YouTube. The link to this is, is available. And they're saying today's environment, in, when there's so much disruption, companies need to not just exploit, which means optimize Horizon 1 type of products, meaning today's revenue streams. You also need to start exploring, and there's no choice. If you don't explore and exploit or optimize at the same time, you are here today and maybe gone tomorrow. And this is exactly what's happening in many companies, and this is why there's so many product failure, because most companies today are either doing just purely a lot of optimization, zero exploration, or some that are just doing mostly exploration, zero optimization, and they have inconsistency in their offering once they launch, and all of these things that lead, all these five things, or any combination of these five things that lead to just repeated product failures. And often, trying to anticipate things that you should have been should have known or should have been preparing for, and now you're just reacting, this is a fact of life. No one controls the market. No one controls buyer behavior. You need to understand it and you need to measure it in order to you to figure out what is the right value proposition. And for the lack of doing this, you're making too many assumptions about the complexity of your offering, the volatility of the buy decisions, the ambiguity of the market and things that may influence demand on the market, and uncertainty. And all of these things equate to uncertain revenue and it's hard to plan growth when your revenue is going like this up and down year to year, quarter to quarter, month to month. You cannot do business or grow a business if your demand is going up and down like this, right? You need to start figuring out how to start focusing on out of the unknown unknowns, identifying them, gather and analyze so that you can actually start making them into known unknowns. And even those variables that can be solved once you have enough information to solve them the right way. And all of this requires a process to, to actually start having this information and the facts and figures and collection is formidable. So why does product management matter? Most companies today are saying product management and product marketing, if they're trying to remain relevant, they've been growing their product management staff. So this is the good news because all of this says that according to CVS report, this is a, a report that came out a few years ago, I wanna say maybe about five years ago, they actually polled North America executives and said, you know, which one are the most relevant, most important corporate roles for the company itself to remain viable in the market? And what came out is that product management is number four, ranked lower only CEOs within companies, other executives within companies, and general managers within companies. Product management is up there because you're working with not just the C-suite, the executives and senior managers, you're working with everyone who's a core business function for your company. And that means that your role is not only highly ranked, but you need to focus in identifying other subject matter experts and be effective at leading cross-functional teams across all of the core business functions within your company. And having said that, a, C a product manager should be mostly orchestrating, not actually doing the actual development or the actual testing or the actual shipping of your product when it's ready to launch. Those are all things that uh, take action. Product managers are mostly leading cross-functional teams. And the complexity of the role is, is usually pretty high. It's one of the highest, most complex roles because most companies today, regardless of who you are, the type of business, you might have maybe eight, maybe up to 12 core business functions. These are critical business functions like 
sales, like marketing, like customer support or customer service, like installation, uh, delivery, fulfillment, supply chain management, all these things that are part, uh, these are all core business functions. And no matter what type of business you are, somewhere between eight to 12. And that becomes complex because a product manager needs to interface with all of these core business functions within any company. Because if you only assign your product managers to two out of the, you know, three or a handful out of the eight to 12, they're going to miss things. And there's no handoffs because somebody else who's not, the, who's not in the role of product management is a specialist in their own field and they're not necessarily coordinating with other aspects within the business. Product management is about to ensure that everything that is core business function is clearly communicated internally. Communicating internal communication is the one of the highest things that product management does, and that means they need to be involved. Even if, even if they're not leading, they need to know, they need to be informed, and if the information is not coming to them, that can be a problem. So what is the most important responsibility for the product manager? In your point of view, those of you who have been in product management for some time, I'm going to launch this poll and I'm going to wait for your responses. And in this case, you want to pick one of these based on your what you're doing today, which one is the most important to you? Is it about leading product development efforts? Is it about doing win-loss analysis when you don't get the sale? Is it managing product performance? Is it talking to customers? Or is it about delivering an exceptional customer experience? I know many of you may be confused because they all seem to see. Pick the one. Prioritize and pick one that is most important within your company today. And then we'll talk about that. And I'm going to give you a few seconds to actually re reply back. Uh, but I want to say that typically this is the challenge of product management, right? Most people think that a product manager can do it all. And maybe true, but having to interface with eight to 12 core business functions within any company is significant work. And then trying to figure out where to spend your time across any of these five areas, or there may be more than five areas. What we teach in the certification courses is that there are multiple areas and at least seven different critical things that product management needs to do. And they, each one of those requires that they actually interface with a different set of teams within the company. And sometimes you got to talk to supply chains, anyone in the, any of your suppliers. Sometimes you need to look for new suppliers, but also you need to look on the demand side and either talk to customers or also turn on new distribution channels. And often you're doing things not just within the company, but also on the supply side, as well as the demand side, and you want to make sure that there, you have the proper business model and the right fit for within the entire business ecosystem where you operate as a business and where your product wants to become a winner. I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to share the results. So most of you are saying that 33% of you, 33%, that's the biggest group, saying delivering an exceptional customer experience is the must, must, right, the number one thing. 22% of you are saying manage product performance. 24%, and actually those two groups are close because they're within 2% of each other, so I think they're pretty much a tie statistically and including the margin of error. 24% are saying leading product development initiatives. And a few of you are saying 14% saying talk to customers, and then 6% of you saying do win-loss analysis. And in reality, all of these things are things that should be done by product management, right? Here's what my perspective is. I'm going to hide and I want to make sure that, yes, I think I have still. Here's what I would, what I teach people, the executives, senior managers, and other product managers that uh, come to my courses. Product management is difficult because you have to realize that the number one thing, that the only difference between you as a product manager and the CEO of a company, the CEO is concerned about what? Not just revenue, it's about increasing the profitability of the entire business. That's the CEO's job. But the CEO 
especially when you have a large product portfolio, may only be looking at not just the top line, but also the bottom line and maximizing the bottom line is the reason why you want to optimize whatever your operations do across any of the eight to 12 functions. If any of these functions and coordination of these functions to actually start improving profitability, you break it down into three major components. And that is the people within your company, the processes and the maturity of your processes, and then look at your entire product portfolio. And looking at all three of these together is what product management is responsible for, for each and every product in your portfolio. And so what it means is that number one, if you have a large portfolio of products, you need to have a larger team of product managers. And then sometimes you need to grow your product management. And we're gonna talk about this because when I come in the first 90 days on anything that I do, I assess across all, th all four of these because I find a direct relationship between any issues, any gaps in the way people are assigned to roles within the company and the way they interface with product management, the processes and the maturity of processes and make sure those processes are consistently applied to all products in the portfolio. And that is clear to everybody in the building, which product are most profitable, which products are sold for cash flow, and usually you need to have both because cash cow products increase your cash flow, means revenue, little margin. Star products are the most profitable and selling more of your star products increases your companies and your portfolios profitability. Having said that, product management is never a one person job. It is a team, and it is a team even when you are a startup, especially a startup that wants to very quickly scale as soon as you have minimum viable product. We'll talk about that. Move on to the next one and say challenges. What are the challenges? And the challenges are many because the challenges can be, there may be challenges because every organization in my experience has strengths and weaknesses across all four of these the fish, strengths and weaknesses in the people and the way that they allocate their people to different functions within the business, core business functions, including product management, processes, and how well their processes are implemented and improved and shed off when they no longer add value. And it's an ongoing process. And the products that they need to defend in the market, which may, may be your cash cow and your star. Everything else needs to be removed so that you can reallocate on the next cash cow or the next star product that you're going to introduce at some point in the market. And that aligning how you allocate your people, how you grow and, and continue to build and improve and optimize your processes, apply that to your entire portfolio over time leads to higher profitability. And the way you, if you pick the answer of managing product performance, product performance includes measuring and managing your product's profitability. And that means that those numbers are coming to you from whoever's tracking revenue, cost structure, profit. And that may be an issue if you're not being told that information or you're being told by executives that you don't need to know because your number one task is to manage product performance. And to me, that means you manage not just cash flow, you manage to see that profit is growing over time, especially once your product is in maturity, which is most of the cash cow and star products. So let's talk about the, the next one. The challenges of, of, and this is actually challenges that are coming in from uh, a study that was done by the by the product by the by the 280 group, and this actually was I, I think done back in I want to say about three years ago, and I want to launch this poll because I want to tell I want I want you to check all that apply when it comes to people, which of these it, 
in happens within your company. Pick any any of uh, you can actually do multiple selection. Tell me which one of these is the yeah, are you experiencing within your company today? Are you experiencing that most product managers, you and everybody else in product management, are too tactical, meaning you're doing day to day and nobody is looking at to what's going to happen next year or two, two years from now, three years from now? Is it that most product managers are unable to influence development or your executive team or other managers effectively, or your executives believe the skill level within the product management team is average at best, or is it that most product managers are not effective leaders and that's how they're perceived? You as a product manager are not perceived as an effective leader within your company, or is it because your executives and, and customers believe you are the best product management team there is in the market, in your industry? Which one of these is reality for you? What your perception about product management within your company? The survey that was done by the 280 group actually did this and they divided this into what they found when respondents were executives, vice presidents, directors, senior product managers across industries, and they polled the respondents, these were all product management, uh, people with the title of product management across industries, and these are some of the things that came out of that survey that was published about three or four years ago. And to me, it kind of rang the bell as to Houston, we have a problem. Because this is why most products are failing today when it comes to the assignment of people within product management, regardless of the company, regardless of the industry. And that is the majority of companies today. This is why the product failure is at 60 to 90%, no matter who you, what industry you're looking for and what type of product you're looking at. So we will, I'm actually gonna close the poll and I'm gonna share to see which ones, because here you can actually uh, ch choose multiple ones. It's obvious that there may be multiple root causes, multiple things that cause the main problem of people in product management, and I'm gonna share the results. So here it is, the largest group, and actually the number one and number two are close uh, within 3% of each other. 29% say most, pro most product managers are unable to influence within your company, either development or technology or management type of things. 26% of you, the second group, most product managers in my company are too tactical. And 17%, and I wanna mention number three is statistically tied, right? Because it's within the margin of error of two to 3%. But the rest of them are 17%, most product managers are not effective, and that is the view of the executives. Executives believe the skills is average at best, and 14% tied also. Executives and customers believe we are the best. So it's kind of interesting to see that many of you are so optimistic about your teams because you chose number five. Because statistically, we know reality from the survey, it's really the, min, the min, min, minority of companies that actually have these beliefs where your own executives and your customers believe you are the best in your industry in, at what you do. But 14% is what we show here. So let's figure out whether this is, uh, how, how statistically close this is to the actual results of the survey, which is one of the most comprehensive surveys that I've found to date. And I mentioned earlier, this was done by the 280 group. So let's take a look. Number one, in people, here's what the, what the results showed. 57% of, of product managers today are too tactical when the role should be mostly strategic because you're not looking at what you're doing today for the next year. You're, only lo you're also looking at year two, year three, year five and beyond. And when the majority of your product managers are too tactical, who's looking at what's next? Because you may need to have a team, not one pair, not one or two people, looking at what's next. Meaning Horizon Two, Horizon Three. Here's the other one: forty-three percent of product managers are unable to influence. That is what came out of this results. It was done in 2015, by the way. If you want to see the results of this, if they're published, I can make it available. Connect with me or sign up on the on, on the on that link I showed you and I will share the result of this particular survey because this was published in 2015 by the 280 group. 
38% of product managers are not viewed as effective leaders within their companies. We have a problem when your most your role, even though your title is product manager, you're mostly leading multiple cross-functional teams. And that means that any deliverable you work on has to be done by a team, not just you as an individual member. And all of these things are root causes or causes for errors and omissions in whatever you decide to do as to what you do in product development or which products that you defend in the marketplace once they are already in market. So let's talk about process because the third thing is about process and 280 Group says there are at least three levels of maturity within any organization in the way they actually have product management processes. They could be ad hoc. Ad hoc is where you start when you're a startup or even when you are a small business and when most everybody is tactical, zero processes, you're at ad hoc, reacting, just reacting. Partially defined means you have some core processes defined, but they're not necessarily deployed across the entire organization. And the optimized is where you're actually working on improvement of your processes, systems, tools, and methods, best practices and adoption of best practices, and then consistently apply to all of your products in your portfolio. That's the optimized. So what I'm going to ask you is, which one of these is your company in today? And I'm gonna launch the poll and you pick one of these three. Are you in your company today, the way you're assigned as a product manager, are you ad hoc? Are you partially defined, meaning you have some processes but not all processes, or they're not consistently being applied to your entire product portfolio? Or are you at the optimized level where you have continuous improvement of processes, your lessons learned are being recaptured, you're looking at what to improve over time, what to stop because it's no longer working, and what new things you need to implement because now you have new tools, new systems, and you're modernizing your product management function, tools, systems, and methods. So let's talk about this and I'll let you respond. Pick one of these three, and this is your perspective, your perception as to where your company is in the maturity of product management and product marketing process. Then we'll compare to the results of the polls as well. I'm gonna close the poll now, and I'm actually going to share the results. So here's the response. The majority of you at, at the partially defined, that's 55%. It's pretty overwhelming because even with the margin of error, most of you, regardless of your industry or product, you're at the partially defined level. And 17% of you are at the ad hoc level, and 28% of you are at the optimized level. And there's no right or wrong, it's just a matter of finding out. Optimization is what most people are doing, and it may be cool and great to do if there's no changes in the market, but it's how reality is that there's no significant changes in the market. How are you doing today if you're at the optimized level and you never, you never anticipate it the impact of a pandemic like COVID-19. This is where the issue is, right? Processes are never static. They're always dynamic. And as conditions change in the market, in your industry, often you have to reinvent your processes. And that's what happens when something like COVID-19 crisis comes in. It doesn't happen every year, but whenever it happens, you need to start repurposing your, the way you're optimizing because you didn't figure out how to take all those things that you were exploring in, or maybe you weren't doing enough exploration. And even though you've been at the optimized level and doing great, now you're experiencing significant reduction in demand. And now you need to figure out a scramble very quickly as to what to do next. So we're going to talk about some of the things that came out on this, on this report and I want to just continue with the, with this for the sake of time. So 42% of executives believe that processes, it, having process is a challenge because most of them are ad hoc or partially defined, and those are not what you need to become a market leader. And even getting to the optimized level, it only means that you're a market leader temporarily if you're not doing enough exploration. 
So all of this means a process needs to be, you need to work on getting to the optimized level. And even then when you're at the optimized level, you still need to ensure that somebody is looking at horizon two, horizon three, to make sure that you're doing exploration in addition to optimization, exploitation. So let's talk about the next thing, and that is profit. How does this impact your profit? People, process, any flaws, any gaps in people and process leads to no profitability, less profitability, and you need to benchmark this, right? So let's talk about this. And I'm gonna actually launch a poll and tell me, what do you think your the perspective is from your shareholders and if you're privately owned from your owners regarding not just your top line, your revenue? Is anyone measuring profitability? Are you tracking, if you're tracking managing product performance, are you getting those numbers when it comes to your product's profitability over time? Let's pick any of these that apply to you, and you can pick from executives who really understand my product, the product management function and how it works and what is the number one thing that is managing product performance, which includes profitability. Over 80% of our products meet or exceed customer needs. My product is at least 3%, three times more profitable than my comp competition, my industry, than the industry average, my competitors, my direct competitors. Do you know whether your product is three to five times or more profitable than direct competing products in the same market? Do we have fully optimized my company's product management function? For the sake of time, I'm going to give you the impact of the outcome of this 2015 study that the 280 group did. And the respondents were all product executives and vice presidents and directors of product and senior product managers within multiple companies, multiple industries, different types of products. Number one, most organizations have deficiencies across people, process, and systems and tools. And all of those not being applied to your entire portfolio means to lower profitability than anybody else who's actually doing this. And market leaders like Apple, like Google, like Microsoft are the ones that continue to work across all three of these to lead to higher profitability than direct competitors. That's how companies become market leaders, is they actually work on all three, not just one and not the other, not just pick one product and not the others. They assign their people and grow their people and allocate their people and then improve their processes as conditions in the market change and then apply that to their entire portfolio. Talk about now, if you are under this scenario, you know that you have some problems. I'm going to actually now uh, stop sharing the results. And this is what, what I was talking about earlier. This is the outcome. The main bottom line of this study shows that most organizations, the reasons why they're suffering in profitability is because they don't do the right allocation of people to business functions, including product management, or the right growth and training and coaching of people in critical business functions, processes because they don't have consistency in their processes and that impacts the performance of their product portfolio, which leads to less profit over time for the entire business. So that's the outcome. So how critical is it for your company to actually optimize not just the function, but also the people and the growth of their people, the processes that they're following and make sure that you apply it to your entire product portfolio? All of this is what the product management function should be doing if you're really optimized. And in most, in most markets, it's less than 5% of companies. The results here are showing that it's 9% of you think that you have at the optimized level. Not really sure because I will be then testing to see benchmarking against your direct competitors. And if that's the case, if you're at the optimized level in product management, like 9% of you claim in the last poll, you would be three to five times more profitable than direct competitors in your markets. And that's the next test that I would do when I, in my first 90 days, 
I, I do a quick scan across all four of these components. And I do a lot of benchmarking across competitive analysis, but also look deeper into your direct competitors and then compare product performance of competing products, including product profitability to actually start comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges, in how product performance is being measured within companies. And invariably, I find gaps, regardless of who I work with, right? This is the reason why executives come to me, because in my function, I have over 20 years of experience as a product executive, and I'm now working, helping product executives within companies figure out how to grow the teams, how to make sure that they have the right processes, apply those processes to their portfolio, and then track profitability against competitors. And if you're getting these four things right in the way you are allocating people in product management, improving processes, applying it to your entire product portfolio, you will lead to growth, not just in revenue, the top line, but growth in the bottom line as well when it comes to your entire portfolio. And that's the value of optimizing the product management function within any company. So this is where I, I usually get engaged, not just as trainer, but as a consultant in figuring out, helping executives and senior managers within companies, how to optimize the function of product management. So we're gonna talk about seven ways that are about boosting the resilience of your product, because if you want your product to actually persevere, and then be able to scale and thrive as recovery begins. These are seven things that you need to consider in building or boosting resilience of your product. And these are not all of your products. These are specifically identifying and ensuring that you are boosting the resilience of your cash cow and star products. So the ones that are sold for cash flow and the ones that are most profitable, you need to start figuring out how to boost the resilience of those products. So now that we know the results and we know that only 9% of you believe that you have optimized, right? We talked about that these are seven ways that you can actually boost the resilience of your product because you want to actually recognize, identify your cash cow and star products and being able to defend those in the marketplace and boost the resilience of those products so that you can persevere even if there's a momentary, hopefully it's a momentary, momentary is relative because of maybe a few months that your demand has gone down and now you need to scale at some point. But even if you're in the case where you're now overwhelmed, right, with demand, you need to start adjusting other things because that increase in demand, it's only gonna be temporary, right? It's not gonna be long-term. And now you need to figure out how to actually scale your productivity and your operational e efficiency within your company to be able to keep up with demand and still be able to deliver a consistent customer experience. Because if you don't deliver that experience that those customers are needing as you are now seeing a growth in the demand, that can also work against you in the long term. So being at either extreme, significant drop in demand or overwhelming demand on your product is where you need to start building and boosting your product's resilience especially if these are cash cow or star products. So let's move on. Number seven things, and we're gonna talk about these seven things all at once. So I'm gonna display all of them because I wanna give you, I'm gonna talk about what we're gonna talk about all seven of these in more detail. First thing is you wanna fix business continuity issues. And we're gonna talk about what is business continuity and what does it matter for you as a product manager, right? Number two, cultivate a growth mindset within your organization. Grow your product management team. That means pick the members, recruit the members, retain them, grow them. Deploy processes continuously because all of these, it's not just a one-time thing. It may be continuous. Once you launch, you need to maintain and support. Optimize product performance and then boost customer value, perceive customer value, and ensure you have a consistent experience and then finally, what do you have to accelerate and when and how do you accelerate when needed in order to scale once you start seeing recovery? All of this means that you're actually boosting the resilience of your product. And what I mean, your product, I mean 
your entire product portfolio. This can't work on a just one product. You need to start looking at your entire product portfolio, which means these seven steps, it's not just one product manager, it's the entire team involved in any of these steps. So let's talk about the number one. The path to resilience of your product requires fuel, and fuel within any company is your cash flow. No cash, no growth. Inconsistent cash flow, no growth. You need to have a consistent, continuous, at least stable cash flow, even as a, there's significant drop. Yeah, now you need to sustain that and then figure out how to grow that steadily to get back to where you were before. Cash flow is the fuel to your company's growth engine. And right now, if you are suddenly experiencing that significant drop on demand or double digit drop in demand, that means less cash flow. And that means you may have a growth engine already, but it's going to run out of fuel pretty quickly, especially if you don't tank up, if you don't top up your tank before recovery begins. And right now you're scrambling to figure out how to control cash flow. Managing your cash flow is the number one thing you need to do. And once you assess your current situation, very similar to what I did earlier, I looked at the climate and I looked at the market conditions and I looked at which industri industries are more impacted by others and which industries are at depression level today, which ones are at recession level today, which ones have had no impact on demand and which ones are have growth in their demand. And if those are not my targets right now, I want to go to where the growth is right now to actually build this up. I wouldn't know that if those are not my current targets. And you need to do a broad understanding of your business climate in order to understand the differences in the industrial sectors that you could target and where the growth is. Because right now in this economy, yes, there are some industries that are in growth, but if those are not your targets, I need to repackage my offering to target those industries to even increase my revenue, my cash flow, until recovery begins. And that all comes with doing the 5C analysis, looking at climate, looking at my, what my competitors are doing, looking at what additional collaborations do I need to have now. And collaborators can be on the downstream side and also on the, on the demand side. So it can be on the supply side, but also on the demand side of you. And this may be new players that you don't have in place today. And then looking at your company, which means optimization of the product management function. So optimizing the role is only one of five components before you start looking at your holistic view of what you really need to do to start planning. But once you understand that you need to actually start going after demand, you, that means that you actually need to assess your product's current business model and then looking at where are the where is the disruption? Is it on the feasibility, which means supply chain and how you're dealing with inventory and all those things that happen once you take in because you're spending, these are part of your cost structures when you, anything that has to do with feasibility increases your cost structures and you need to reduce your cost structures and actually figure out how to increase the desirability in order to increase revenue and implement new revenue streams. And you might need to do all of those things in order to maintain the viability of your product. And viability means revenue minus cost structure is a positive number because that is profitability. And that means that you're not missing any major things that are cost structures or you're not missing any revenue streams because those are all cash flow for your product. And you need to figure out in a team environment what is reali the reality of your current business model that you have implemented in, in place? And then design and deploy changes because you might have disruption across all three of these. You may have to do something about increasing the desirability, increasing the feasibility, and therefore you're increasing the viability. You have to do all three in the way you would design and deploy changes to your current, to your product's current business model. And Here's an example, enterprise holdings. 
So enterprise, and I talk about this particular example when I compared enterprise to other competitors in market. This, are, this is a car rental company that is in US, now has become number one in all of North America because they have been growing for the last decade and a half faster than Avis and Hertz and other competitors. And they're number one today in North America. Enterprise Holdings today has reinvented itself immediately when the pandemic was announced and many college students were actually said, no more school, go back home because now you're gonna be finishing up the rest of your academic term online, virtual courses. Overnight, they were told this around spring break here in US, that was our reaction to lockdown. Many colleges shut down their campuses and sent their students home. And at, this was a time when airlines were also shutting down operations. Nobody want, wants to take any transport, public transportation because of the possibility of being infected. Enterprise announced for college students that were in trouble that they would waive because the normal driving age is 25 years. Even though you can, you can have a driver's license at the age of 18, you're paying a higher price if you want to rent when you're below 25 because you need extra insurance because of the risk of you driving a vehicle when you're a, a, a new driver. And this is where the majority of college students because they're all between the age groups of 18 to 25. They actually promoted their product, which means you could call up, they would bring a car near you and they would waive any additional free fees for young drivers that wanted to rent a car to get from campus to get back home to their parents as they were now scrambling to now uh, be, be able to attend classes virtually and not have the need to pay for campus allocation, rent at uh, near a campus or at the campus. So this is what Enterprise did uh, to promote their product. And the result is their sales went up because they promoted their product. They didn't change the product. They just promoted it to the targets that were mostly impacted because now they're they need to do something else and now they need to relocate when they were thought they were taken care of at least until the end of, of the academic year, which is usually around this time of the year. Um, May, June is when most campuses here actually start finishing up the terms. So that was an opportunity for enterprise and this is why they've been growing because their product managers are actually doing optimization of everything, not just the product, but also all the elements of the marketing mix, including place and promotion to align to market conditions. Path to resilience of a product, of any product portfolio, also requires the right mindset. Not just the right mindset within executives, it's the right mindset between everyone who's a leader or a leader of leaders within the company. And very quickly, you realize that not all companies have a growth mindset culture. And there's a difference between having a fixed mindset and growth mindset. Fixed mindset people can actually do optimization quite well, but that's all they can do is purely just optimize because fixed mindset cultures optimize only and don't explore. Growth mindset are the ones that can optimize and explore at the same time. And those of you that are claiming that you have an optimized role within a product management role, I wanna know what your growth mindset index is within your leaders, not just your product managers, but also your executives. And there are assessments that measure growth mindsets within companies. And if you're claiming this, you should be in the growth mindset. And that means that you have both initiatives that you're actually just doing optimization but you continue to do exploration no matter what. Don't, and there are very few organizations that, that have a growth mindset. In my experience, it's single digit percentage compared to the majority of everybody, all the players that are in the same industry, same market. So getting to this culture, if you don't have the right culture, you might have the right strategy, you might have the right execution, but you're not exploring enough or all you're doing is purely optimizing because it's comfortable and it's what you've done for a long time. So growth mindset is what you need to do to do. And growth mindset means that you're continuously inspiring all of your workers. 
that are in critical business functions, especially those that are customer facing, which includes not just marketing and sales, it includes customer support and others that are part of having a consistent customer experience. And the people that work hard at doing that, inspiring continuously, and it's not just a one-time thing, it's continuous training and retraining of customer-facing workers, regardless of who they are or their roles, when they're part of the customer experience, retraining them drives profitable growth in demand. Those employees will impact your customers and those customers will drive even more people through referrals to get you into the growth that you need of the same product. Just because you have employees that deliver a great experience that these people want to rave about to their followers, and now you're getting lots of referrals from those customers. That's what growth mindset people do. Walmart is one of the winners. Walmart is today the largest retailer in North America. They're not just in US and Canada, but also in Mexico, and they continue to expand. They have lots of different locations of different shapes and sizes that are retail locations. And I wanna say five years ago, maybe seven years ago, they actually started a new line of business, which is walmart.com, which is started in Silicon Valley. And walmart.com last year became the number two e-commerce seller in North America, second only to amazon.com. And yes, amazon.com is right now number one in e-commerce sales. In, in North America, and they've been for, for the last 10, 15 years. This is why now Jeff Bezos is now a trillionaire as of, as of this week, because everybody's doing e-commerce. Those of us that are working from home, we're not necessarily shopping by going to the store. We're ordering online, and it's not just from Amazon. Number two is all the e-commerce portals that Walmart.com has now deployed in North America and they have one unique value proposition that Amazon.com cannot match, and that is you, you can have a di different way of buying, which is you buy online, pay for it, and then you can pick up at the store near you, and now you're getting status on the mobile app about you know when to come by and just curbside pickup of whatever you bought online. They will just give you a time, an appointment, where you can just show up and drive through. You don't even need to get out of your car. They will bring whatever you already bought to your car completely touchless when it comes to just take you all you need to do is just make sure that you're putting the package uh, in your car and then take off and take it home. Amazon.com today has not that ability because they don't have many retail locations today. They have a few that they're starting to test, not enough. Not the type of retail locations that have thousands across North America today. And they're actually getting a lot of growth in demand as retailers of groceries and clothing. And I mean, they're the largest retail. So anything you buy from them, you, you can buy online and pick up the way you want to pick up. They can also deliver, by the way. The path to resilience requires growth. And growth means that you need to grow your teams. You grow your people, including your product management team. You'll be amazed because the follow-up to the 280 Group uh, survey that I talked about earlier, in 2019, last year, they published about a year ago now because it was published in April of last year. The product managers, few, very few organizations actually grow their product management teams. And the reality is that in most cases, when I do live training, when I ask the question, how many of you have had how many hours of formal product management training very few people respond that they have any training at all, right? Even as they have been in product management for more than a few years. So growth is where it starts, but it's not the only thing, right? And in the certification courses that I'm doing training, it's not just one domain expertise. I mentioned the complexity of the role is that you have to interface with all these subject matter experts, not just development, but other subject matter experts that are part of core business functions. Guess what? Product management has 15 domains that you need to be above average at best. So you're not necessarily the top subject matter expert across any of these. You may be across maybe a handful of these, 
but you need to at least be above average compared to the rest of your organization and even your competition to, across 15 domains of expertise. And in the certification courses that I conduct for Lioran, our courses, we go over all 15 of these domains to make sure that you know exactly what it means to be above average across any of these 15 domains. And if you look closer, the one that is claimed to be at number 11, actually it's number eight, at 15.2% that most people are, it's domain knowledge and domain knowledge can be technical knowledge. I'll tell you, when I started uh, working, I, I was actually, I had my bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering. And over time I became a manager of development teams and I did development for a long time before I ended up at a company called Lucent Technologies, which had just been split from AT&T, the service provider. And that's where I learned about product management. In that five year span, actually within three years of me being there, I actually expressed my interest to shift into product management, going from development to product management, because I really liked what product management was all about. It was not just about doing, it was about thinking, and it was about deciding and making decisions as to what is the future going to look like and then enable development teams to build the right things to make that future happen. That's the reason why I love product management. It's not for everybody, but if you're in the growth mindset, you're not only optimized, you need to explore and explores means you not only think about what the future is gonna be like, you actually enable people within your company to actually allow them to create the future by building the future. And that is future products, not today's products. And yes, you need to do both. But product management should be about figuring out what is the right balance between optimization and exploration when you need to do both. And that's the outcome. And now what we say is that you need to be great at this. And the assessment says, when you say that executives um, say that you're below average compared to the rest, this is what they mean. These are where the major, the top three areas where most product managers that actually filled this survey, and this report is also available from the 280 group, I can share it with you if you connect with me, or if you uh, sign up on my uh, on the bit.ly short URL I sent earlier, I will share that with you. But here's the outcome. End of life, very few product managers have any idea or any clue as to how to retire or withdraw products from the market. And when the majority of your, fail of, of your products need to be withdrawn, that's a problem because you wanna do it in a graceful way, not to anger customers or not to lose customers. If you do this right, you're actually retaining at best, oh, sorry, at the very least, if you're doing it right, if your function is truly optimized, when you withdraw a product, you offer something else and that not only retains the current customers, but also acquires new customers that are now in market. Then most everybody is deficient at competitive analysis, meaning they there's very little benchmarking that I talked about earlier. When you're managing the product performance, you just don't measure internal metrics. You gotta compare the same numbers and compare apple to apples, oranges to oranges, against your own direct competitors. And if you're in multiple markets, your direct competitors are different. And that means benchmarking is huge part of managing product performance, measuring product performance. And then pricing. The reason why most products don't become profitable is because nobody in the building, including product management, works on pricing of your products. And you just assume that somebody else has it, and guess what? Nobody does especially when this is your product, price is one of the elements, one of the most critical elements in the marketing mix that at the right moment, a small adjustment in price leads to double digit growth in profit, not just revenue, profit for your product. And you not you having deficiencies as to how you price or how to price a product is a huge problem when it comes to profitability of your product. So we talk about all of these things in our certification courses. And 
if you need more, there's more. Here's a companies that actually see a significant drop in how they repurpose, right? You have Aventec, which is actually a company that has been making the next generation of ventilator systems when there's a shortage right now because of COVID-19 crisis. People that get critically ill may need ventilators if they're going to survive when they get go when they wind up in a hospital. And Aventec is a mid-market company today that needed to increase because they saw overwhelming demand. They needed to increase from a few hundred systems that they are able to manufacture in US on a monthly basis to at least 10 times more. Well, they needed to look for collaborators. And very early on, companies like GM, the automotive manufacturer, said, we have lots of facilities that we're willing to give to you, make them available to you to actually help you ramp up production of your ventilator systems. And they're not the only one because everybody else, Ford and Tesla, everybody else did the same thing where they said, yes, we can help. And the mid-market company by increasing in collaboration with players that are not, this is not their domain. It's a collaborative partnership between two different companies in the way they're ramping up production of ventilator systems. And right now, They've been doing this since this pandemic, since we went into uh, safe uh, into this lockdown mode here in the US. These are all opportunities. You won't think about this if all you do is think about your swim lane and you're only optimizing in automotive. This is where you start looking at, hey, who do I collaborate with to go from being a villain or someone who's not even in mind right now on top of mind in my customers to being top of mind because I'm actually enabling smaller players to do the right things because of the current situation. And this is where uh, you're seeing this, this growth and people that actually start looking at lateral thinking to figure out how to actually create and stay with the right brand awareness to make sure that whenever people go back to buying a car, as opposed to thinking about, like, I need a ventilator for my family or somebody, if it's not you, it's somebody else in your family or somebody else you know. And now uh, you're seeing that brand awareness by that partnership. The path to resilience requires a playbook. And playbook is all about process because in any winning in the business is a team effort. If it's a sport, it's a team sport, not an individual sport like tennis. Winning in the marketplace as a company requires that your entire team is coordinating what is the right balance of offense, defense, and special teams based on what's happening in the market and who are your closest competitors and who are you competing with today compared to next quarter, compared to next quarter. That's process. It is not just about product development, it's about how do you maintain market share and product performance and continue to have better performance on your product compared to comp competing products in the market. That is what product management process should entail. Most people only have a few processes and don't do enough of other processes that are part of product management. And those are the gaps in process. What this study showed is that not only training and growth of your people, but also process matters even more because you can actually multiply. It's a multiplier effect. You have people who have a very little product management knowledge with some training. They can actually have a process and whatever little they can do, the process will multiply the results. So the process is a multiplier of your collective team members that are all product managers. This is what the value is of having a process that is applied to your entire part portfolio, not just a few pet products. And this is also part of the gaps. And so what you know what to do, and we talk about in the um, certification courses, we talk about a framework, a framework that you can use to actually start creating and improving product management process. From new product development to products already in market, you can divide it in two large halves, and then seven different phases that go from left to right in things that you do or don't do and how you make decisions when it comes to products that are currently in development, not yet in market, and products that and how they're handled 
and the processes that you apply to those products to make sure that you do all the right things to improve the performance of those products over time once they are in market. And it's almost like you have two halves to your processes. Products that are not yet in market that are for Horizon 2, Horizon 3, and then products already in market that are Horizon mm -hmm. 1. And this is where your current cash flow and profit is coming from. And that fuels your growth engine. Your growth engine is about Horizon 2, Horizon 3, which is new product development. Most companies don't connect the two, right? You have may have different players only assigned to products already in market and do whatever it takes to just do that and just optimize on that without looking as to how to align new product development and when to actually start focusing on bringing them to market at the right time. Not when the products are done, but when the market is ready for adoption. That's is the, the, the challenge of most companies is how to time what products they have because they're just like desperate or you know wanting to look to to launch thinking that the market will see the value just by the product itself and the only thing they're doing is just losing first mover advantage when they're launching prematurely before there's ensured high product to market fit these are all things that only product managers can discern because no developer no coder, no quality assurance person, no executive will be able to tell you that because this takes a lot of work. And it's trying to predict the future. Nobody can do it without having the right access to the right data so that you can make data-driven decisions, not just gut-based. Because gut-based is what you do when you're ad hoc and you know what the results are when you look at the failure rate of products, new products being launched. 60 to 90 percent failure rate of products and it allows you to start implementing proven methodologies meaning you start getting knowledge about best practices being used by companies like apple like microsoft like google like amazon aws all of these players that we talk about those are best practices that are being used regardless of what the industry or product is they're all product management processes these are all can be applied to any product, no matter what your industry is. And we talk about the deliverables by phase are all documents that product managers or product marketing managers lead, but they need a team to put together relevant information across any of these documents that are depending on where in the, in the life cycle of, of the product you're in, from new product development to already products that are in, in market. These documents are never done by one person. They're done in a team environment. If you're doing it one person, guaranteed you're going to miss a lot of things that should be done. And at the very least, if you can, because you have the years of experience, it's going to take you longer because you're doing it, everything on your own as opposed to getting a small team of people to help you. And you as a product manager or as a product marketing manager become the publisher maybe editor, not the content creator, because you rely on other experts within your company to bring their subject matter expertise and put it in the right section on any of these documents. And here's Apple, right? Apple and streaming right now, today when you're everybody's in lockdown mode and everybody's working from home, what is the choice of you doing? Because you may have some spare time, what are you doing? You're using more Netflix or you're using more of all the, any of these things. And here's Apple products because Shazam is now the newest multi-billion dollar acquisition that is being added to the Apple Music, even as Apple has already announced retirement of the iTunes application. Because iTunes has been is being dissolved right now and is being converted into multiple components. One of them is just streaming of music, and it's going to have integrated behind it the Shazam engine. Those of you who are familiar with Shazam, you can just turn on the app, listen to a song, and it tell you who it is, and maybe even give you the lyrics and where you can actually view the music video. All of those things are available via the app. It is now owned by Apple because that was an acquisition they made made early about a year ago, I want to say, multi-billion dollar acquisition 
that is now being integrated and in being part of Apple Music. And my guess is that they're also going to be extending it to streaming shows, videos, shows, and movies that they have on the TV+. Plus. These are streaming products. Redbox and Netflix are all in market. These are the ones that are tuned in my to actually capture even more and win more market share and become more profitable. They're going to be in growth mode right now during lockdown and probably for until recovery starts. Optimize product performance. You optimize because at the very beginning when you start putting together your strategy back in the, in the time where you have to reboot your entire business operating system, back when you're in number one, we talked about being able to maintain business continuity by doing better cash flow means you focus on earning before you spend, means you get paid before you actually incur additional cost structure. Now you need to actually start measuring to see the results. And measuring product performance means that you need to track of all of these things, profitability of the product, the multiple revenue streams that you need to get to profitability and grow your top line, but also your bottom line. Anything that is financial on this side, provide metrics behind that. Look at your customers and the customer segments and their industrial sectors because they all will have different demand and you need to go and start positioning your product against the ones that are going to grow in demand. And it's not everyone. It's only a few players out of any entire market. And be able to then adjust your processes accordingly to either focus on either retention and acquisition of new customers at the same time that you're focusing on the amount of growth that you're doing, not just with the product management people, but also other core fu business functions that are needed for growth in order to be able to make this entire strategy work the right way. Make sure your strategy is, ex is actionable, executable. And if you're a product manager tracking business uh, pr product performance, you need to benchmark against your competitor. Part of competitive analysis is benchmarking your product's profitability against competing products profitability in the same market. And profitability changes by market. So different players, different markets, multiple ways of measuring success. And benchmarking can become complicated when you're working across markets. Here's a leader, AWS. Today, everybody wants to be like AWS. And AWS is a leader and they continue to be a leader. And in today's market, what people need to do because they've been lagging in order to recover, they need to become an AWS user because they've been laggards in adopting cloud-based services to start digitizing their entire business model. And AWS right now is in growth mode, just like any other players and everybody wants to be like AWS. They've been the leaders and this is the reason why it's not just Amazon.com that's getting growth. AWS is also getting growth and growth, not just in revenue, but also profitability. This is why Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, the holding company, is a trillionaire for the first time ever. There's a trillionaire in the world's history, and that is Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon. Because all of his teams, every business unit has different product management teams, and they all know how to create resilience of their products that are Horizon One and continue to do lots of exploration. Here's companies that are seeing momentary growth, right? These are the ones that are making those masks, the N95 masks that moving forward, experts are saying we all need to wear, even as we are venturing outside of our home for whatever we're doing, whether it's going to work or going to the grocery store or going to get a haircut, whatever that is, we're now having to wear masks. These are the manufacturers of N95 masks. Yes, 3M is the largest, but Moldex and Honeywell are mid-market companies. And right now, these are ramping up production of N95 masks. 3M is doing it globally, not just for US because they're a global mask vendor. Moldex and Honeywell are just US only today. But I, I guarantee that in a few, it, it, by next year, they're going to become, they're going to expand markets and they're going to become international N95 mask vendors. Around the world right now, everybody's trying to scramble, figuring out how do we protect ourselves 
in order for us to feel safe about venturing outside of our homes. The path to resilience requires focus, and focus means you focus on understanding what is the perceived value proposition in the minds of your customers in order to boost that perceived value so that now you can actually start doing other things to your product. Because boosting the perceived value leads to not just the growth in sales, but opportunities of repackaging products that are star or cash cow products sell them into and upsell those customers, but also acquire new customers. Understanding perceived customer value is not just for retention purposes, it's for also acquisition, and it's for those vendors that today, their entire product business model is upside down. What I mean by being your model being upside down is that your cost structure is higher than whatever you're getting paid by any one customer. And that means that every time you capture, you're still losing money because your cost structure per customer is much higher than your entire base of subscribers. This is an issue for companies like Netflix today, for example. Yes, Netflix has been around, but for the most part, whatever you are paying, if you are indeed paying for the year, because most everybody is just turning on the free 30-day trial, turn off, and then they will turn on again at some point later. Right now, cost structures for Netflix is growing as they've been expanding markets and whatever they're collecting from each one of us, it's upside down. Their entire model is upside down and it's been upside down for some period of time. What you want to do is figure out how to use other elements of the mix outside of product, including price, to become well-balanced business model. That means whatever you're getting paid per customer, whether this is an entire organization or a set, uh, a segment, that the lifetime value, meaning how much they buy, the size order, the order size on a yearly basis so over time it is lower than the cost of acquiring customers. Most companies that are struggling today are upside down, right? They're in the first, in the first role, they're like this instead of this. To, to actually be able to move and well balance, you start looking not just at product, you start looking at the other elements of the marketing mix to become a much better, well-balanced product. Here's an example. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, and like uh, just add on because of ETHAS and everything. Uh, maybe some people would have like some questions to ask or something, so maybe they can write them down in the meantime, and we can uh, as well maybe move in, in the question and answer section. So uh, because of ETHAS and everything, so we don't want to you know we hold on a lot to, uh, to the people. What do you? Think? Yes. That's, that's fine. Uh, what I can do is I can actually just uh, uh, give an overview of number seven. And number okay. seven is accelerate when needed. And accelerate means that in most cases today, what people are saying is that moving forward, the next normal is that those businesses that have no or done very little digitization, digital transformation within their business in order for them to actually reduce cost structure, be able to do more and do more, meaning more digital marketing than ever before as now people won't be you won't be able to engage people face to face you need to do, do a lot more digital market than ever before that is all digitization of your business and there are entire industries such as food manufacturers food and beverage manufacturers have been typically laggards because they've been optimizing and that's all they've been doing not exploring and what they need to accelerate now these are the Pepsi Colas, the Pepsi, the, the Coca Colas when they're regional, or anyone that is a food and beverage manufacturer, they need to digitize. And digitization means that digital transformation efforts for those industries needs to be increased. And they need to consume from people that can help them design and deploy digital transformation efforts to digitize their entire business model, both on the supply side, on their on the business side but also on the consumption side, across the entire value chain, they need to digitize. And there are many laggards that have been not doing nothing, nothing but optimization. Even when they have product management teams, they haven't assigned their product management teams on how to digitize and where to digitize first. And in most cases, product managers, when this is not their expertise, this is a domain expertise that is missing throughout the entire company. This is your opportunity if you are one of those vendors that has 
digital transformation services to deliver, now you need to start educating your targets because targets may not know who you are, what you do, or what it means to digitize their business. You need to make it simple. But in order for those customers to deploy, these are the five components that are about making sure that you can exploit and explore at the same time and making sure that your entire product management team knows what you need to optimize, which is Horizon 1, versus where you need to explore, which is Horizon 2, Horizon 3, which are always going to be a year or, or, or more from today. And it's a sliding window in the way that these horizons happen over time. So it's continuous work that you look to optimize for profit, optimize for growth and learning. And you need to make sure that those lessons learned are deployed, not just within product management, but critical business functions within your entire organization. And you can do this. And Zoom is the number one collaboration tool that has been gaining today because it, Zoom has been around for some time. Most people are stuck on legacy systems. And Zoom is right, right now the number one video conferencing system that people are using to have these agile sprints and, and, and stand-ups when now everybody's working remotely. Even when you're agile, uh, you may have been doing the stand-ups physically and no more physical stand-ups. And now you need to start adopting new tools and Zoom is one of the ones that has been leading. So in summary, we went over these seven steps. Accelerate means that in most cases, in most industries today, you're gonna need to accelerate things that you have never done before. And that means you have a lot of unknown unknowns. If you need help in accelerating, digitizing your business, or any of these steps, come to me because I'm open to at least have discussions, figure out what your current situation is, and at least point you in the right direction. It may, not, it may or may not be able to help you, but most likely I can help you by making sure that your team gets certified. And here's the reasons why you, you as an individual should get certified. And this is for those of you who are either currently underemployed or currently employed but unhappily employed because your company has now had significant drop in demand and no, you don't really know whether you're currently working, but you don't know whether you're going to be working here in the same company a month from now, two, three months from now. This is why you want to get certified if you're in that, in that sec segment. If you're in the company that wants to get your entire team optimized and your process is optimized, this is why you want, should consider certifying your entire product management team. And everybody in product management, along with everybody else who works along with them, should go through any of these certifications. Certified product manager, the product marketing manager, CIL, and these are all Lioran products, and we're offering them virtually. You can sign up for those, and if you already have one, I would recommend that you do the others as well because you will need them in order to optimize different aspects of your product. And here's the announcement on the next coming up, June 14th through the 18th is a live virtual where we're gonna do five days of live virtual sessions that will get you to the certified product manager. More of these certification courses will be announced later this year as reality for me is that this is going to be the rest of my next 12 to 18 months is doing not in-person delivery because it's going to be impossible for me to travel internationally. If you are in MENA or Saudi or UAE, anywhere in the MENA, this is your product if you want to become certified this year. So I would recommend that. Here's talks and information as to where you can access some of my talks because I record all of these talks just like I'm recording this one, I, um, I record all the previous ones and I make them available to anyone that's interested. And if you want to set up a time where we can talk and do an exploration as to how I can help you either certify your team, grow your team, build your team, or build you to become a much better, more effective product leader, set up some time. Here's my email. Here's my LinkedIn profile. And here's my Twitter handle. So with that, I think we're ready for questions. And um, do we have any questions? I, I think we do, because I've seen some some of these, but just give me some of the top ones. And I can think we can actually mm -hmm. spend some time. I can say we can extend the time. For those of you that need to go, feel free to reach out to me. I can 
give you the recording because we're going to capture all of this. But if you need to go, well, I want to thank all of you for attending. If you want to stay, you can stay. Go ahead and, and, and stay because I, I, I want to do uh, I do want to answer some of the questions that we have and maybe spend a few more minutes just answering questions. Yeah, true. Uh, I would say, like, I will add on as well. Thank you a lot for all, for this informative uh, session. <laughs> uh, you provided a lot of uh, valuable information. And I'm not seeing this uh, on my behalf. I'm seeing this on behalf of a lot of people who commented. Um, a few people had to uh, uh, leave because of uh, iftar, uh, but we have a lot of uh, engaged participants who have few questions to ask. So maybe we can um, start by a simple question. Maybe we can say like. Uh, uh, Mr. Eman has a question saying, uh, could you recommend books that can gain our skills as a product managers? So yes, number one is um, AIPMM published the ProdBoc, a guide to the ProdBoc, and that's uh, available uh, via Amazon.com. Uh, it's available as a, as, a, as a copy, as a hard copy, and you can also buy the Kindle edition and all the courses that we talked about that is for product management, product marketing are based on that. It's a publication that is about over 250 pages and it's all about product management and product marketing best practices. It has more details and um, normally we, you know, that's your best approach if you want to do some self-study. I can say that my take on this is that it does take a certain knowledge to actually be able to get the full benefit of just looking at that, but right now, it's it's the one number one reference outside of, of of actually coming to any live courses that we're offering that offer the certification, and and that's the 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 number one publication for product management product marketing. I would recommend the ProdBoc, and I uh, I can provide the information if you connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know that you need it. I can send you the link, but it's available. Just do ProdBoc, and I will send the actual term. The acronym, so you can look it up on Amazon.com, and Amazon.com you can actually do a keyword search on that, and you'll see that it's available, and you can either buy the hard copy or Kindle edition, and that's the number one reference. Thank you, uh, um, Mr. Nasser Bamalan has a question. It's actually a quite interesting question because I think uh, you covered uh, a bit of this. Uh, he was asking, um, what are the most advisable sources to develop our product management skills? I think with the uh, Formal uh, training, I think you kind of answered, but maybe you can add on top of it more. Yeah, so in my experience, you know, the mindset is most people think that uh, live in person is the best quality, and it is for one reason, and that is the level of interaction that you're able to do. And I can tell you that the platforms that I'm using, my courses are very interactive and completely different experience than on demand. So if you try to go to Udemy or Udacity, any of these, when these are all pre-recorded, there's zero interaction with the instructor. The difference is, and this is the reason why we actually, Lioran is doing, uh, the virtual courses that are offered by, by Lioran are the next best thing to being in person. And I'm actually working with, with Lioran to actively improve how to ensure that there's consistency in the delivery of live virtual courses that lead to certification. So the certification courses I mentioned earlier, the four certification courses are available as live virtual training moving forward for all of 2020. And I'm working with Leoran to schedule those. The next one that's coming up is in June. We're gonna be announcing a CPMM that is a certified product marketing ma manager course soon. It's coming in June, July. So this is the best uh, approach to getting, if you're interested in getting your certified this year, or certifying your team this year, these courses are not just publicly available, they are also available for in-house delivery. And that is the best approach right now because you're gonna find that there's no, let me put it this way, I would venture, there is no expertise to the level of expertise. I've been in product management for over 20 years and I've spent the last 10 years doing nothing but training of executives and senior managers within companies and doing not just public courses, but also in-house courses. I've been doing this for 10 years as a practicing product manager. I don't think that you're gonna get that benefit from anybody in your regions if you're in the MENA region. And the reason I know that is because that the feedback that I've gotten from doing multiple deliveries of live in-person training in UAE, in Saudi, 
the rest of MENA. So the live virtual courses is the best approach to getting someone like me to be live because everything else out that is out there is just on demand and there's no interaction with anyone. It's just recorded information. Yeah, that's, that, that's quite useful. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Guna Natar uh, Natarajan has a question. I think this will be like maybe a, um, a general uh, answer, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I, uh, I'll say, how telecom enterprise impact in MENA region? So it's kind of like a, a general, but maybe you can say a brief. So I would say in uh, right now, uh, Telco has been uh, sort of trying to reinvent itself because it used to be that uh, the phone company became uh, an ISP, meaning they provide now broadband access and everybody else has been shedding landlines, not just at home, but also at work. The majority of us have now migrated to voice over IP or some other service, which is MMS, multimedia services, not just texting and voice. So yes, we still do a lot of voice and yes, we do a lot of texting, but that's done over multimedia. And most everybody today is actually consuming more video than anything else interactive video and that's what i'm working on right now and making my courses more interactive by not just having a live instructor but also having recorded content and when you're buying you're buying a combination of both uh on demand but also live and then the live after the live session becomes on demand for that course and that's the kind of model that i'm moving all of my courses to and and right now and uh, with Yoran, I'm focusing spe specifically on certification, but I'm going to be launching in 2020 more of the hands-on virtual workshops for product managers, for product marketing managers, and I'm going to be doing more of these hands-on workshops. Things like, how do you start putting together a market needs or market requirements document? How do you put together a product roadmap? How do you put together a business case for your product? All of these things, these are more detail, more hands-on, things that we don't get into enough detail because of lack of time in a certification course. I'm gonna be introducing a whole, a, a whole slew of those type of courses that are just available on demand um, as virtual live training in combination with on-demand training. And we're gonna be announcing those. If you're interested in those, connect with me on LinkedIn or write me an email because right now I'm working on what platforms I'm going to be deploying that in, and that's currently in the in the works. But I will be launching those in the next two or three months. Yeah, um, a lot of people missed on the McKinsey report. I think I will answer them uh, uh, this question. Uh, you will have uh, the whole presentation available afterwards online, uh, shared through all the links as um, Trichector mentioned. So if you want to preview a few of the slides or some other, because there was a lot of beneficial uh, information. Uh, we'll share the link afterwards and you can access it. I think that that can answer uh, to a lot of people who were inquiring about the McKenzie. Um, we have a question from Peter uh, who was asking that, do you think that psychology is important for product managers like in taking necessary courses? I personally see uh, it is very important, especially that a product manager deals with many people from different backgrounds. That is correct. So you, you don't necessarily need to have uh, a psychology course but you just have to have access to the right experts, right? I mentioned that earlier, there are at least 15 domains of expertise for anyone that wants to be exceptional in the role of product management. It does. You don't necessarily need to be a psychologist or an anthropologist, but you could have access. And if you don't have access within your company, you can outsource that, that type of work to understand buyer behavior. And typically there are service providers that do that. I can definitely, uh, at least refer you to some, but some of those. But what you need to do is understand what are, where does this help you, right? And I mentioned earlier that one of the biggest gaps uh, of, of, across in domains of expertise where you're below average is understanding or empathizing, understanding buyer behavior is the problem where most organizations struggle because the people who are trained by profession to really understand by behavior are someone that is, you know, anthropologist, business anthropologist, business psychologist, and you don't necessarily need to have them in your team as product managers, just outsource that work and go to experts. If you need help in identifying experts, uh, let me know. I can, I can at least point you in the right direction. 
I also just sent via the chat the link where you can sign up so you can actually fill up that web form that's in that landing page. You'll get an automated reply, and then later on, I will send the link to a post event page where you get in that in that landing page access to my entire slide deck, the video that I, is being recorded of this live session, and also a podcast because I'm going to have all three of those in addition to just a brief summaries and information to additional references that I use for this particular talk. Um, another actually quite interesting question. Um, what is the percentage of passing CPMM and how many people pass out of the hundreds? Uh, if I can add on on this, I would say it depends if Mr. Hector is your trainer or, or somebody else. I would say if it's with Hector, it's 100%. <laughs> yeah, I would say. I would say that out of all the ones, and I actually work for a lot of different uh, providers. Um, you know, I, I used to be a, a, an expert trainer for the 280 Group here in North America. They're the largest that offer these certifications. I, I worked with them up until a few years ago, and um, you know, I, I've been with the best, and I know that uh, out of everybody else that you have access to, um, the highest I have the highest percentage rich compared to anyone that wants to get any of these certifications that are AIPMM certifications. And it's not just me saying it, I have uh, actually referrals that and proof that uh, I get the highest passing rate. And I think passing rate is not just a, 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 the, the, the consistency of the delivery, right, of the trainer. It has to do with your own ability to be engaged. And in my courses, I go the extra mile to make sure that no one gets left behind. And if that is not product management. That is about understanding how we all have different learning styles. And I use a blend of things because I realize that the majority of communication is nonverbal. And I do a lot of hands-on, but also uh, I use a lot of visual tools and use visual tools and then you know, look for opportunities to start putting exercises behind those visual tools that, you know, as to how you can do product management in a agile, using an agile approach to product management. Um, I, I think we don't have a question, but we have some uh, quite uh, lovely comments, uh, uh, as uh, many other similar uh, that uh, I received. Uh, a lot of people would say uh, thank you for this amazing, valuable session and hope to be with you for the upcoming courses. This is one of the few similar comments that we uh, received. So it's quite nice to hear uh, positive uh, thoughts about all this. Um, before, uh, I think that this will be the last uh, last one as well. Uh, I think we should come to the end as well because of uh, iftar and the fasting. I think uh, everybody's eager as well to uh, go. Um, should, uh, do you want to add, Mr. Victor, something before I, I close down, before I say the final words? Or yeah, I, I just want to make sure that at least I want to thank all all of you, and I want to thank you, Victor, for for uh, moderating, but also thank all of you for uh, staying this long. And I really appreciate uh, all all your comments. I, I would um, ask if you want to reach out, uh, you sign up through my page, or uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. We can follow up, and I look forward to those of you who are interested in signing up for this. June course that's coming up, the Certified Product Manager, sign up and uh, let me know if you have any questions in between. I want to make sure that at least you guys are signed up and then we can actually start engaging even before uh, delivery starts. So at least you know what to expect. But I think that with this information, I made it so, so you can actually get access to everything that you need in order to ensure that you're making a decision as to whether or not to sign up for this course that's coming up, because this is the one that's coming up uh, soonest. There'll be others that will be coming up and announced later in 2020 where I will be the expert trainer for Leoran, and those will be coming soon. So uh, if you're interested in this one, go ahead and sign up. And Victor actually is the, is the person to contact to actually sign up and enroll. And uh, if you have any questions regarding the actual delivery, uh, feel free to contact me right away. Let me know you signed up and we can at least, um, you know, I can guide you to additional things that you can do to prepare before the actual start of the course. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was very nice to hear. So, okay, so um, thank you everyone. On behalf of Leoron uh, Group, Mr. Hector Del Castillo and myself, uh, it has been a really great pleasure to have you all today and we are honored that you attended the How to Lead Your Product Through the COVID-19 Crisis uh, Live webinar. 
Um, we hope that we have met and even exceeded your expectations and you have gained as much value from the experiences as possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, you will receive your certificates and your emails very soon. Um, also, a very small present from our site for all of you here today will be delivered in those emails, so take a good look. And uh, because the present can be used for the next upcoming training events. So we hope that you have enjoyed the program, that our collaboration uh, will not end here. Um, and as you can see on the last slide of the presentation, we're going to have a five day uh, live official training course for the Certified Product Manager International Training Program uh, on June 14th. Uh, the event is with limited number of participants. So if you enjoy today and want to extend your knowledge, in the field of product management, I'm suggesting you to join us on the training session happening, uh, as I mentioned, June 14th uh, till 18th, five day session. And uh, write down my email address, Mr. Hector's address, so feel free to reach me anytime. I will be glad to assist you with information and, of course, uh, to sign up for the event too. Um, we look forward to seeing you there and thank you. Thank you so much. This will be the end. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.